So community ecologists are going to study how communities interact. And remember, a community is all of the different species in a particular area. So community ecologists are going to ask, how does one species cause another species to change? There's three main kinds of interactions that we find in communities, competition, predation, and symbiosis. Competition is fighting over resources, usually within the same trophic level. There's two kinds of competition. There's interspecific competition, which is competition between two different species, and intraspecific competition, which is competition within the same species. And the difference here, intra within, inter between. In interspecific competition, there's two possible results. One, one of the species goes extinct, and that means one was a superior competitor, and the other one never gets any food or never gets any nest sites. The other possibility, and what is more common, is that both species will be present, but both at lower numbers. And often we don't even know that these kinds of competition interactions are happening until one species is removed from an ecosystem and we see another species population go up. Intraspecific competition is behaviorally a little more interesting because generally you don't want to kill off other members of your species and so over evolutionary time different groups have developed ritualized displays or territories so that you can minimize the actual fighting that happens. So something like wolf territories are an example of intraspecific competition. You have two packs of wolves, they scent mark the edges of those territories, and maybe once every year or two years they would actually fight over those territories, but the rest of the time they respect those scent boundaries. Ritual displays where males show how strong they are by having large antlers or bellowing so that they don't actually have to fight and females can make decisions about who they're going to mate with. This video is an example of intraspecific competition. The next kind of interaction we have are predator-prey interactions. And I think everyone basically knows what a predator and a prey is. But this is when one organism eats another organism. And so this is an interaction between trophic levels. So a wolf eating an elk, an eagle eating a fish, a shrew eating an earthworm, a deer eating a rosebush. Um, all of these things are going to be predator-prey interactions. Um, these first two are sort of classic big predators. Remember that it doesn't matter how big you are, you can still be a carnivore even if you are two inches long, if you are eating another organism. Um, and even deer eating a plant is a form of predator prey. We don't really think about deer as predators, but to the rosebush they're very much predators. And we have a fancy word for that, which is herbivory. So prey species have evolved a series of adaptations to avoid being eaten. And we'll just go through some examples. Protection and armor. Here we can see this rose has sharp thorns. This little armadillo has a hard outer shell that makes it difficult to eat. Camouflage is a great kind of uh, way to avoid even being seen. So here with this little owl is just blending in nicely with the bark of the tree. Uh, sometimes camouflage is not just blending in. Camouflage can be looking like something you're not. And so both of these species are exhibiting something called eye spots. This is supposed to look like the eye of something much bigger. Um, when a bird flies up to try and eat this moth, it opens up its lower wing and it looks like something very big just opened its eyes. It's not going to fool the bird for very long, but it's going to create what's called a startle response where the bird backs up for a second and that might give that moth enough of a head start. This at first looks like a snake head but in fact this is the back end of a caterpillar happily feeding away and so this definitely stands out it's not camouflaged but it also doesn't look like something that a predator would want to try and eat. And then this video is probably one of my favorite examples of camouflage so enjoy that one. 
Toxins and warning coloration are another uh, form of defense for prey items. If you produce a toxin, that will prevent individuals from eating you. Now, there's a trick here. It doesn't work very well to produce a toxin and get eaten and have your predator die and now everybody's dead. Instead, you need to warn the predator that you're toxic so he or she won't try and eat you in the first place. And so organisms that are toxic generally have some kind of coloration that warns you. Uh, red and yellow are classic warning colors in nature. And so here we have a coral snake, which is highly poisonous. There are cheaters in this. There are organisms that will mimic the colors of a poisonous uh, organism, but not create poison. And creating poison actually has a physiological cost on the organism. That's energy that they can't put into growing and reproducing. So it's got to be worthwhile. And these cheaters don't have to put their extra energy. So there's an interesting uh, thing that happens in ecosystems. Uh, they can usually only handle about 10% cheaters. Otherwise, predators start catching on. Like, hey, I see a lot of these snakes. I'm going to try one. Oh, I don't get sick. And so they start to eat them more. Group together. This is also a defense mechanism. Um, mini eyeballs gives you increased vigilance. So you can see a um, predator coming and you can make an alarm call. Uh, when I was an undergrad at UC Davis, I actually got the opportunity to spend three weeks in northern Pakistan in the Himalayas helping a researcher study the alarm call of the golden marmot. And we were studying specifically how the group dynamics worked, who called, turns out everyone takes their turn making calls for different predators, and we found out that they had different alarm calls for ground predators versus aerial predators. Staying in a group also makes it more difficult to single out one individual. And you can imagine if all these guys were running together, you're not sure where the front end and the back end is. And this is important. If you're jumping on a zebra, you have to get it in just the right place, or you're just going to get kicked really hard and not have a meal at all. Another option is to just be really, really fast. So I think everyone knows about cheetahs, but it turns out they're only fast like that for a minute at the most. So they have these bursts of speed, and that gazelle just needs to be fast for a minute and a half, zigzagging back and forth and getting away from that cheetah. So with all of those adaptations, how do predators possibly ever find food? Ironically, they use the exact same list of adaptations. They use physical traits like sharp teeth, claws, and talons. They use coloration and camouflage. Those same stripes that break up the outline on the zebra break up the outline of this tiger as it's sneaking up on something. Predators like uh, rattlesnakes produce toxins. Some predators hunt in groups. And, and the prey might be fast, but the predators may even be faster. This actually comes from something called predator-prey coevolution, where the selective pressure on the prey is how good the predators are, and the selective pressure on the predators is the new adaptations that the prey develop over time. Our last category that we see in community ecology is symbiosis. And this is a direct relationship between two species. Within symbiosis, we have three main categories, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. A common mistake is for people to assume that symbiosis just means mutualism. But symbiosis is this umbrella concept of two species having a close relationship, and it could be any one of these types. Commensalism is when one species benefits without affecting the other species at all. And so the example I have here is an epiphytic plant. 
this orchid-like plant is growing on a much larger rainforest tree. It's not a parasite, it's not sucking nutrients from the tree, it's not heavy enough to affect the branches, but it's getting up high in the rainforest to get light, so that's a benefit to the orchid, and it's not affecting this tree at all, so that's commensalism. Mutualism is where both species benefit from the interaction. And there's many different examples of this. You always have to include the sea anemone and the clownfish, the Finding Nemo example. The fish lives in the anemone. The anemone has stinging cells, so it has a home with an electric fence. So it's got a safe place to live. On the other hand, the anemone is protected from other larger fish because these guys are very territorial. And they clean up around the anemone, so they protect it and keep it clean. This is an oxpecker bird. These guys ride around and pick ticks off of the deer and antelope. It's getting free food. This guy's getting uh, parasites removed. Now there's an interesting thing that happens with different kinds of symbiosis. We have these three nice categories, but of course in nature everything is not quite that simple. Occasionally oxpecker birds will pull out a tick and then keep picking at the skin of the antelope. And then you're merging over into parasitism a little bit. So some of these things there's a bit of a gray area probably one of the most important mutualisms on our planet are plants and their pollinators. So plants produce nectar to attract insects, birds, bats, they feed on that nectar and then incidentally they carry pollen from one plant to the next which helps those plants reproduce. We said earlier based on the 10% rule, that the plants in an ecosystem determine the overall size of the ecosystem. And upwards of 60% of the plants rely entirely on their pollinators to successfully reproduce. Finally, we have parasitism. And this is when one species gains and one is harmed from the interaction. So here we have a flea as a classic parasite. This is the most common form of symbiosis in nature. Almost every living thing has some kind of parasite. We have multiple parasites living in us and on us on a regular basis. Parasites are usually species specific, so they only survive on a particular individual. So the lice that affect humans doesn't affect dogs or cats. The lice that affects birds doesn't affect us. So they tend to be very, very species specific. Parasites usually aren't fatal. And if you think about the biology of this, it doesn't make sense to kill off your host. You need your host to move around and spread you to the next individual. So it's okay if they get sick or weak, but you don't want to kill them off if you can help it. There's both internal and external parasites. A flea would be an external parasite, a tapeworm internal parasite. This picture is showing mistletoe, these little tufts of green. This is actually a parasite. It's got its roots embedded in the trunks of the tree, the branches of the tree, and it's sucking out the nutrients. So it, this is not a healthy tree because it's under full mistletoe attack. And that's a basic introduction to ecosystems and population community ecology.